Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more. Not just about our world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for those willing to question what they think they know or what they may believe. Those willing to be uncertain for an hour. I'm Eldon Taylor and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner, Ravinder, waits you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Ravinder, do you want to tell us why everybody should come to your chat room, assuming they can? Because it's a wonderful group of people, because we have lots of fun in there. We always learn something new as well. But yes, the can part of it's really important. Don't... uh, Come to our chat room if your boss is looking over your shoulder or if you're driving. Both of those are considered no-nos. But if you can, come join us. Um, You know, come participate in the conversation. Just see what's going on in there. And we also post uh, additional information in the chat room as well. So that is provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Okay. And if, um, if they're unable to join you on the chat room, they can come back later when they're listening, um, I mean, after the show. They can they can see the log. They can find these URLs that you might post or the videos that you might show. How do they do that? Yep, simply go into the archives. You know, if you check into a particular show, you'll be able to play the show, but you'll see the chat log right there as well. And, uh, yeah, you know, if, if something is mentioned on the air that maybe you didn't catch a name or an URL or a place, you know, then we try to get that posted up there in the chat room as well. All right. In today's spotlight, I wish to directly take on the issue of what to believe when responsible scientists disagree. This is something we've addressed in the past. However, it's also of critical importance. So visiting the subject one more time from a different perspective may be helpful. You can pick any number of subjects and find strong disagreements between fully credible scientists, experts in their field. Take, for example, global warming. 40% of qualified scientists doubt that global warming is man-made, according to the National Association of Scholars. However, if I turn the page and read Skeptical Science... I find them reporting that there's a 97% consensus among scientists on global warming. So two questions arise immediately. The first, do scientists really disagree? And or second, is it those reporting the information with some agenda that cherry pick the data? The fact is that when you study any issue that has traction among the public and politicians, you find that agendas do drive the articles and scientists do disagree. Today's show is no exception. Should creationism or some version of it be taught in the schools? According to many, the idea of teaching creationism is not only so much nonsense, it actually undermines scientific education. Indeed, they urge that science must defend evolution. Richard Katsky, writing for U.S. News, has this to say about the issue, and I quote, Should we teach creationism in public science, in public school science classes? Of course we should. If we want to violate the Constitution, dumb down our students, and make our nation an international laughingstock. Real science begins with a question and looks for the answer, wherever, whenever it may be found. It isn't about dogma, it's open inquiry. Unlike creationists, real scientists aren't afraid to change their hypothesis if the facts don't support it. Close quote. Now, contrast that to the arguments made by those who want creationism or intelligent design taught in schools. These proponents argue that intelligent design is not a criticism of evolution and that teaching evolution and intelligent design together sharpens minds and advances critical thinking, is demanded by many parents, 
should be protected free speech is an important historical matter and further that evolution is bad science. Why bad science? Because evolution is closer to a philosophy than it is a science. Is that true? Now, our first show this month featured Professor J. Scott Turner, and we heard many scientific arguments that would agree with a statement that evolution is incomplete at best and undeveloped as a true science at worst. So again, just these two simple examples illustrate how difficult it is today to sort out matters when scientists disagree, and they very often do, especially on those subjects we are most interested in. So, coming a full 360 degrees around, the question remains, what are we to do when responsible scientists disagree? Dr. Monsur is this to say, quote, Science and scientists are involved in many different types of controversies. When these are based upon the results of research experiments, the disputes usually are valuable for science. When these are based upon emotions, politics, or ignorance, these disputes usually are not able to be resolved and often are a waste of a scientist's precious time. Well, how should we then come to our decision? Maybe it should be a more scientific approach, free of our bias. A clear, rational mind examines the data, evaluates the methodology, considers any and all relevant context, carefully assesses both sides of any position, and finally forms their own conclusion based on facts. Unfortunately, how many of us has actually taken the time to do so, even when the arguments are headed toward the ballot we will mark with our decisions? My thoughts anyway. What are yours, Ravinder? You know, that's uh, an interesting spotlight there, Um You know, you talk about scientists disagreeing. I tend to think, you know, you get some of that herd mentality that happens within science as well. You know, they want to carry on believing the same thing. So when someone comes up with a totally different idea or a different viewpoint, they can be attacked. So they have to bring up quite a bit of science on one side in order to counteract the other. And then you talk about, you know, we should evaluate the data. Well, as you said, you know, trying to find the time to do all of that. Um, I think there is a really delicate balance between having an open mind to different ideas um, and not falling off the edge of the cliff because you're just open to absolutely everything. It's a juggle. It's a juggle. I don't have an answer for you, I'm afraid. You know, when you talk about scientists and the resistance there is to paradigms, of course, we discussed that before. You know, Mm -hmm. Kuhn's work on on paradigms. But just today, I posted uh, a a new study that showed intelligent people will ignore facts in order to accept that information, which goes along with their bias, their political party or, or whatever else is involved. Now, these are intelligent people that do that. So, you know, we're not talking about an absence of intelligence here, we're talking about a bias that overrides the vigor that should be involved in coming to conclusions based on facts. You know, you're absolutely right. I've known many intelligent scientists who just resist the possibility of anything else that they actually refuse to question science because they think that the conclusions are already there. So when you bring up something, then they'll come back and and shut it down but yeah it's their own biases that are coming into play because you know you have this deep divide between science and religion and um science and anything alternative so you know yeah i don't know that we genuinely have that deep divide but we'll we'll maybe discuss that a little more I think today. It's the norm. There are, you know, you choose up what you want to believe and it might be that you know, as some have said, the new religion is is science, you mm-hmm. know. Yep. Um uh, and, and and we have we see people dedicated uh to um 
and I, and I don't want to use the word blindly, but rather uh, without honest questioning to propositions to use the words of William James that are full of white crows, anomalies. Yep. Um, but okay, we'll be t- discussing that a little more today. All right, every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Last week our show featured a discussion regarding relationships. Alan wrote, I love this show and would like you to do another one. This one was just too short. Richard commented, Soulmates. It's confusing biological limerence with some fantasy, spiritual, whatever. Limerence, the state of being infatuated or obsessed with another person, typically experienced involuntarily and characterized by a strong desire for reciprocation of one's feelings. So if you find you suck at emotional self-management, are you interested in improving that? Huh? Don't change me doesn't sound so good in the context, does it? CB wrote, nobody ever says at the beginning, hey, that relationship stuff is going to be a lot of work. And whoa, Nellie, I don't think I've ever heard any pre-relationship advice that says, you know you are going to change, don't you? Good comment, CB. Amy wrote, at some point all of us will find that you must choose between changing yourself or changing who you're in a relationship with. Moving on, Walter wrote, I have sent many of your excellent Intertalk CDs and MP3s to traders who are dealing with psychological challenges. Eddie Rosenberg speaks highly of you and told me at our recent mastermind that you have helped him quite a bit. Thank you for all that you do. Well, thank you, Walter. Alan, Aline, I guess it is, Aline wrote, Eldon, thanks so much for being there for us. I really enjoyed your latest newsletter. This is great stuff, valuable beyond measure in these times. I started in the higher consciousness pursuit back in the year 2000 and find it to be quite elusive and abstract for lack of a better description. Your approach has helped me to better identify with life on the higher plane. Well, thank you, Alin. And for all of you, the newsletter is free, and I invite you to subscribe, and you can do that by going to eldentaylor.com. Leon wrote, I have benefited much from Intertalk CDs, and now I am a changed person. Okay, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but we do love your comments, so please keep them coming. You can opine by writing to me at Eldon, that is E-L-D-O-N, at EldonTaylor.com, or by joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor. We do sincerely appreciate your thoughts and ideas. Now to today's show, The Human Instinct, with author, Professor Ken Miller. His copy states, and I quote, I've done basic research work on the structure and function of photosynthetic membranes of plant cells, leading to more than 60 scientific publications. But I am also well known as a public defender of evolution and have written two popular books on the subject, Finding Darwin's God, A Scientist's Search for Common Ground Between God and Evolution, and Only a Theory, Evolution and the Battle for America's Soul. His new book, The Human Instinct, How We Evolved to Have Reason, Consciousness, and Free Will, is the subject of today's show. Okay, let me tell you a little about today's guest. Dr. Ken Miller is Professor of Biology at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. He is a cell biologist who has also been active in the public sphere, appearing on television and radio to support scientific integrity and the teaching of evolution in our schools. He's co-author of the nation's most widely used biology textbook and in 2005 was the lead witness in the landmark Kitzmiller v. Dover federal court case on the teaching of intelligent design in public schools. So on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Professor Miller. Thank you. Very happy to be here. We're, I'm excited about today's show, uh, and we're very happy to have you here. But we like to know three things on this show, Professor Miller. Who is the messenger? What is the message? And, of course, how do we use it? So to that end, please share with us what it is that you know drives you. What about your book and your passion that, that just motivates you? 
Well, there's a couple things. Um, I began my scientific career um, basically intending just to be a researcher and an educator. And in my very first semester at Brown University, where I teach now, um, I was challenged by a group of students to debate the theory of evolution with a so-called scientific creationist. In fact, the country's most prominent scientific creationist, a fellow named Dr. Henry Morris, who founded the Institute for Creation Research in California. And at first I deferred and I told the students, look, I spent my days at, uh, working on an electron microscope. I'm not an evolutionary biologist. But they pressed me and they pressed me and they said, well, is evolution wrong? Is there a fundamental flaw in the theory? And my answer was, no, of course not. The, the, the evolution is a vigorous scientific field. People are fighting about it all the time. That means if there's basic problems, they're going to be uncovered. Uh, the theory is going to be upended and this sort of stuff. Um, so, of course, it's valid. And finally, I said, okay, I'll go ahead and do this. And what this resulted, and this is my first semester here, I was still setting up my lab, is five or six weeks worth of researching the arguments of scientific creationists, including this Dr. Morris. Um, and it was critical at the time, because this was 1981, and mm -hmm. two states, Arkansas and Louisiana, had both passed laws mandating the teaching of creation science in the public schools, and neither law had been tested in the courts yet. So they were both still valid. And when I dug into this, I was just appalled at what I would regard as the intellectual dishonesty of many of the arguments that were raised against evolution. And many of them weren't biological. They had to do with physical uh, arguments like the size of the universe, the amount of meteorite dust on the moon, the slowing of the Earth's rotation. And I found myself running um, between astronomers and geologists at my own university to sort of get tutored on astrophysics, on radiometric dating, and a whole host of other things. And one of the things that I discovered in this process is, and, and I found this right away when I debated Dr. Morris, is evolution is presumed to be sort of a stalking horse for atheism. And Morris immediately attacked me uh, for what he presumed to be my lack of religious belief, um, unaware of the fact that I was and am a practicing Roman Catholic. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I saw at the time that this presumption was what drives an awful lot of the hostility towards evolution. And another thing that drives that, that hostility is the idea that evolutionary biology is not just a branch of science that attempts to explain the origin of species, but it's an all-encompassing philosophical system that basically has something to say about human values, about culture, about art, about music, and everything else. Now, I have no doubt that there are people who want to apply evolutionary principles to these area, areas, but they simply aren't part of evolutionary science. So I had a, a really a remarkable time debating Dr. Morris that drew me into public controversies about the teaching of evolution in schools. I started to write articles about this. I got invitations to go and speak on it. Um, finally, after explaining again and again and again how someone could be a religious person um, and still accept the validity of evolutionary science, I wrote that first book, Finding Darwin's God. Um, and basically what I've continued to do since then, when I've had the opportunity, um, is to not only show how religious people can accept evolution, but also to basically insist that evolutionary biology, properly understood, is not a belief system that dehumanizes us, that minimizes the human condition, that demeans the human achievements on this planet, um, and that basically properly understood um, evolution is exactly what Charles Darwin said at the conclusion of his book, The Origin of Species, which is, as he put it, there is grandeur in an evolutionary view of life. And it's that latter part on which I based this most recent book, which is going to come out in two months, basically trying to argue that those who have used arguments from evolution to minimize their own species, to take human beings down a notch, to say that, well, we're just another animal struggling for existence on the surface of the earth, they're missing something. And they're missing something important and fundamental about human nature. That's where I'm coming from.
All right. You heard today's spotlight, Professor. What have I got wrong? Well, um, one of the things uh, one of the things that, that I heard, and I was taking notes as I listened to it, um, mm-hmm. was the notion that um, the new religion is science. Well, let me let me let me respond to that in a certain way. When Please. people sometimes say that science is a religion for some people, well, let me tell you something. Um, um, I love baseball. Um, I was a baseball player as a kid. I coached uh, uh, my children uh, in, well, in softball because I only had girls. I didn't have boys. Uh, and I actually umpire uh, baseball and softball. I love baseball. Mm-hmm. And if you ask my wife, she'd say, yeah, in the summertime, baseball is Ken's religion. And what she means by that is using religion as kind of a metaphor, as something that he loves, finds fascinating, and really enjoys participating in. Um, of course. Th- that's not a religion in the same way that someone is a Buddhist or a Jew or a Christian. Um, so when you say that, you know, that, that uh, evolution, that, 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 that the new religion is science, I think most scientists would reject that for a very simple reason. Um, and that is that the cardinal virtue of science um, is skepticism. Now, I did hear in the intro that, you know, scientists are closed-minded, they reject new ideas. Sure they do. And they do it because scientists are human beings subject to all of the frailties of our species. Scientists can be racist, they can be sexist, they can be homophobic, um, they can be resistant to new ideas, they can attempt to guard their own positions. But ultimately, the reason science works is because, well, I'll put it frankly, it appeals to the worst in human nature. And what I mean by that (laughs) is the desire to make a name for yourself, the desire to get ahead. And a young person in science does not attain a tenured position at an Ivy League school, does not get grants by doing research that says, uh, yes, existing theories are correct. That's boring. What every young scientist dreams of is uh, upset, uh, turning over the apple cart, upsetting, uh, upsetting established dogma. Um, that's how you get ahead in science. And basically that sort of built-in um, uh, that, that, that sort of built-in reward for doing something new and revolutionary is ultimately what drives science. And despite all the things you hear about scientists being closed-minded and stuck in their ideas, uh, the way in which science actually gets, gets ahead is by people who want to overturn those ideas, who want to move forward. And I have to tell you, as someone who teaches both general biology to my freshman year students here at Brown, but also an advanced research course in cell and molecular biology, the biological sciences are moving so fast, it's hard to keep up with them. And that's very much at odds with the picture you sometimes hear that science is stuck in its ideas and it's not going anywhere. Right. Now, just to be fair, uh, Professor, I was not saying that I believe scientism is the new religion. There are those that look at how scientists respond particularly on the far skeptical side, uh, the Michael Shermer side, as a case in point, uh, the Richard Dawkins side. And they look at that and they say, well, these these people, you know, I mean, they worship scientism. Uh, That's not me saying that, but that is the, you know, that is uh, a point of perspective out there regarding what drives sometimes uh, the abyss between two scientists well, fair, fair enough fair enough and I take your point um, I'm actually uh, good friends with both Michael Shermer and Richard Dawkins mm-hmm. uh, Richard has been really quite generous in promoting my books in the United Kingdom he's given me generous mention in his own books but my disagreements with Richard are fundamental and I'll give you an example of one of them and I'll make it very quick um, one, of, one of Richard's most memorable sentences and he likes it so much he actually put it in two of his books is the universe that we know, the universe we know through science, um, displays uh, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And the first time I met Richard face-to-face was at a conference at NYU, I think it was in year 2002, and I just uh, went up to him and we had a nice chat, and then I reproduced that quote for him, and I said, blind, pitiless indifference? How do you manage to get up in the morning? 
And if you can imagine the best Oxford reply that you can conceive of, he threw his shoulders back and he looked at me and he said, well, the universe may not have a purpose, but I do. And I thought that was interesting. <laughs> it is. Uh, but it's also a question of philosophy. Um, and the minute we have questions of philosophy, well, we're, we're headed somewhere besides fact. Uh, and, 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 you know, that can call into question, why is there something instead of nothing? Oh, indeed. Um, and, uh, and I, indeed. And I think that remains an important question. Uh, Lawrence Krauss, uh, a uh, uh, astrophysicist who's now at, I think, Arizona State University, three or four years ago published a book called A Universe from Nothing, arguing right. that we no longer have to ask that question, why is there something rather than nothing, um, on the basis of certain developments in basic physics. Dawkins wrote an enthusiastic afterword for that book, saying, now we can do away with that why is there something rather than nothing question. But it turned out, I think much to Richard's chagrin, that Lawrence had made a fundamental mistake, because modern physics has not shown that universes can come literally out of nothing. But what he was recounting was research that shows that quantum fields, which exist even in empty space, are capable of allowing matter and antimatter to come into existence spontaneously. Um, that seems to be the message of some recent developments in physics. But it begs the question of where do these quantum fields come from and where do the laws of nature come from that allow this to take place? So the question right. of why is there something rather than nothing is still a valid one. And every review of Krauss's book that I've read, including mostly reviews by atheists, self-identified atheists, have pointed that out, that that philosophical question remains. I'm familiar with that work. In fact, I don't know if you're familiar with it. We've got a hard break coming up here. I'm going to have to jump out of this. But just before we get to it, uh, Professor Lezik uh, Kolakowski uh, has written yeah. a book, Why Is There Something Rather Than Nothing? He does take on the field issue from a philosophical perspective through several interviews with uh, oppositional uh, perspectives, um, derived from physicists and uh, you know when it when it's all said and done uh, that remains a very important question i totally agree with you all right we're speaking we'll pick it up there when we get back professor we're speaking with professor ken miller about his work and book the human instinct how we evolved to have reason consciousness and free will you can learn more about our guest by visiting his website Vivo, V-I-V-O dot brown dot E-D-U forward slash display forward slash K-E Miller. Or you can Google Professor Miller, Ken Miller. You'll find him in a, in a heartbeat. Now we have a video for you in our chat room featuring Professor Miller discussing Richard Dawkins. So if you're not in the chat room already, now's the time to get on over there. And you can do that by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat okay do stay tuned we'll be right back you're listening to provocative enlightenment with elton taylor change has never been easier whether you wish to lose weight stop smoking build better relationships become creative enjoy ultra prosperity or simply relax and promote self-healing inner talk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love inner talk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used inner talk. Vicki wrote, my hubby has been using the stop snoring CD and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your inner talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Alvin Taylor.
Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with Professor Ken Miller about his work and book, The Human Instinct, How We Have Evolved to Have Reason, Consciousness, and Free Will. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website, vivo.brown.edu forward slash display forward slash K.E. Miller. And in case you have trouble writing all that down, Again, Google the man. You'll find him in a heartbeat or check our provocative enlightenment chat room that uh, will be posted there. Now we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some true significance to them. Music psychology is a field of research with practical relevance in many areas, a hobby of mine, indeed a book I'm working on. And those relevant areas include intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. So we just played some of Bruce Springsteen performing Born to Run. Now, I don't know, Professor, did you choose this one because it has very provocative lyrics and you're on provocative enlightenment? But hey, why is this music important to you and how does it inform us about who you are? Um, there's a wonderful line in the song that says, Sprung from cages on Highway 9. I grew up a block from Highway 9 in New Jersey. Uh, so I'm a New Jersey guy, just like Bruce Springsteen. He's from Asbury Park, uh, which is right on the shore. Uh, when I was a little kid, my family didn't have a car. We used to ride the train down to Asbury Park. That's how we got to the ocean. Uh, so, so from the very beginning, I have loved Springsteen's music, danced to it. Uh, when I was younger, I uh, listened to it when I drive, and I listen to it when I'm working in my lab. So that's mm-hmm. the significance of it for me. All right. So, but till then, tramps like us, baby, we were born to run. That kind of stuff has no relevance. It's just uh, oh, it's highway got, nine. It's got, it's got wonderful relevance. I can remember <laughs> my wife and I dancing to that exact music and just shouting at each other, tramps like us, we're born to run. It's just wonderful, emotional, and very evocative. Good. I like that. All right, Professor, the subtitle to your book presupposes that we have free will. Indeed. And yet there's a lot of evidence out there that suggests otherwise. We use fMRI today. We watch the brain make a decision lifetime. A technician will know six seconds on average what you're going to decide before you decide. So it would appear that the subconscious is making these decisions. Uh you know, Ben Libet's work back in the 50s, the cortical right. evoked uh, potential, suggested that if we have any time whatsoever to change our mind consciously, it's milliseconds. What do you mean by free will? Do you really believe we have such a thing, or is it only available if we do something special? Okay, so let me let me let me take issue with a couple of things that you led up to. Please do. Uh, one is we have fMRI studies that show that certain areas of the brain sort of light up, preceding a decision, and so forth. It's very important to remember what functional magnetic resonance imaging actually shows, and what it actually shows basically. Um, is the density of hemoglobin molecules in a certain area of the brain. That's an indicator of increased blood flow. It's not a neuron firing. It's not an electrical potential. It simply shows that blood vessels are opening up, presumably because an area of the brain is more active. And we're not looking at 10 cells, 100 cells. We are looking at tens of thousands of cells in a single uh, pixel on an fMRI image. I don't want to interrupt you, Professor, but, you know, that's maybe a step aside. If you look at the hard work here, a technician can actually know what you're going to decide, which alternative you'll choose. He'll record it. He'll be 100% accurate. So, uh, you know, all of this about... P three hundred waves. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. So 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 let's so so let's talk about that and specifically and talk about decision making. And you use the figure six seconds. Um, that's widely disputed. And let me give you an example. And I, you know, I'm sorry. I'm going to bring up baseball again. Um, um, when you're standing at a plate and a pitcher throws, well. In my youth, probably the fast, fastest fastball I've ever seen was just 80 miles an hour. I still couldn't hit it. Um, but you don't have six seconds to make the decision. You literally right. have milliseconds. Um, right. And it's swing and no swing. So it's a yes or no. Um, what 
what most of these studies really show is the preparation for making a decision. And when you talk about the controlled experiments in which there's predictability, um, my own reading of that literature is that the predictability is not quite as good uh, as you are saying that it actually is. Um, this has been uh, Daniel Dennett, the philosopher uh, yes. at Tufts University, in his book Freedom Evolves, has gone into the Libet experiments and has basically showed that the, those pre-decision times basically are, in his view, an artifact of the way in which the experiments were done, uh, and they're not necessarily genuine. Even though, um, you know, and, and even if there are events in the brain that precede a consciousness of a particular decision, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're an automaton or a robot. Um, completely deterministic. Now, I'll make an argument for free will. Well, if you, if you read the chapter in free will in my book, one of the things that I'm quite clear about is that arguments about free will, have, uh, whether or not it exists, have been, uh, have been going on all the way back to the Greeks. And in that chapter, I did not pretend to settle it. In other words, I didn't say, okay, here's the brain, and here is a mechanism by which we have authentic free will that can be experimentally validated. But what I did point out are the difficulties of, of accepting that we don't have free will. And I'll, l let me give you these quickly because I know time is limited. Um, even Stephen Hawking, uh, the great scientist and very much a materialist, realized that if we truly lack free will, it means that we also cannot make independent scientific judgments about the validity or interpretation of experimental results. And the, uh, I can't reproduce his exact quote, although I put it in my book. Um, but basically, he said, if we are programmed by the conditions of the universe to come to certain conclusions about how the universe operates, how can we possibly know whether those conclusions are valid? In other words, it undermines science itself. Sam Harris very well-known author, yeah. uh, re uh, recently wrote a small book. I'd almost call it a pamphlet because it, it's less than 100 pages long on free will. Um, and he made very passionate and very well-informed arguments about how the nervous system works, and these are pretty persuasive in a certain context. But to me, the most revealing part of the book are the last four or five pages where he's trying to bring it to a conclusion, and suddenly he has to explain to his readers how he – who presumably does not have free will either, came to the decision to write this book and why he wrote it. And he has to throw his hands up, and he has to say, I don't know why I wrote it. My brain just made me do it, and I don't know why I'm ending the book right now, except I think I'm hungry and I'm going to go get something to eat. And that's when the book ends. Right, um, I know, th I know th the work. I wanted yeah, to read your book. I always read the books of guests that come to this show, Professor, sure. and your uh, publisher said, you know, I'll get it to you. And then when we didn't get it, they said, oh, we'll get it to you. And then when we didn't get it, we'll overnight it. Oh, and, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sorry it never arrived. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I, 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 I know who to take issue with in my publishers, and I'm terribly sorry about that. I, <laughs> I, I really, I mean, I really, I, I really do apologize. Um, no, the, that's the, all right. It, point... it sounds like a book I would recommend had I read okay. the book, but I can't let, recommend it without let, reading it. Right. Let, but let, you're let doing make... a great job of recommending it yourself. Well, let, let, let me give you one more point that I tried to make about free will. Please one do. of the reasons I included a chapter on free will is because it is widely uh, believed, and Daniel Dennett has pointed this out too, it is widely believed that the whole idea of evolution is the enemy of free will. That if you accept evolution, then you accept that natural selection has pre-programmed our brain to think the thoughts that we think, and therefore you really are not an intelligent agent. And one of the points that I tried to make is that if we do have free will, it was evolution that gave it to us in terms of the increasing complexity of our brain and the larger and the increasing number of factors that we can take into account when we make decisions. We can consider complexities in making decisions that no other animal even comes close to. That's the result of the evolutionary pathway that led to the human nervous system. So the point that I wanted to make is not that I've proved the existence of free will, but to the extent that we either do have free will or that we have a very sophisticated kind of decision-making that seems like free will, it was, in fact, evolution that gave it to us. So evolution is not the enemy of the idea of free will. If free will exists, evolution is its source. I might comment there, you know, if nature gave us free will, nurture taught us not to use it. <laughs> okay. Listen, 
You're a devout Catholic and an evolutionist, and you believe God and science can coexist in the chapel and the lab. Given this demarcation, do you think some form of creationism or intelligent design should be taught in the science classroom? Or is this more a subject of religious philosophy, history, or some other humanities course? Indeed. And that's a really, really good question. I heard you lead up to it in the intro to, to the entire program. Just a couple of qualifiers. You put the word devout in there. Uh, I don't think devout is an adjective that I am worthy of. Um, what I like to tell people is uh, I am a practicing Catholic and I will keep practicing until I get it right. All um, right. So we'll accept your humility, but, Professor, yeah. moving but, on. But no, it's, it's not humility. It's realism. And, you know, okay. I'm, yes, I'm, I'm in the pews every Sunday. I receive the sacraments. Uh, my faith is important to me. But I'm not going to put myself in the devout category along with Mother Teresa or somebody along those lines. <laughs> um, All right. In, ter- in terms of the specifics of the Catholic tradition, it's very important to point out that um, and I have to tell you, as a Catholic, I got a lot of problems with the Church, and I can list them, and we can talk about the clergy sexual abuse scandals, the issue of authority, the treatment of women, and everything else. But um, four popes have written in support of the idea that the theory of evolution can be basically accepted by someone who practices the Christian faith. That's mm-hmm. beginning with Pius uh, the Twelfth in 1947. Uh, the current pope, uh, was trained as a Jesuit, um, uh, is a Jesuit, excuse me, was trained as a chemist. Um, and when he was asked a vague question about religion and faith and science, um, he said, hey, we have to accept that evolution and the Big Bang are real. Uh, and that sort of surprised people, but it shouldn't have. And the reason for that is take the Big Bang. These scientists who worked out the mathematical foundations of cosmic expansion, which is what we call the Big Bang, wasn't mm-hmm. Albert Einstein. It wasn't Edwin Hummel. It was um, it was Georges Lemaitre, who was a professor of mathematics and uh, uh, mathematics and physics at the University of Louvain in Belgium. And uh, Lemaitre was a Catholic priest. And it surprises people that a religious person is the person who worked on this and certainly saw no conflict between science and faith. If you go to the great Catholic universities in this country, go to Notre Dame, go to Loyola University, go to the College of the Holy Cross, you'll discover their biology departments teach about evolution. So um, I wrote a book about how I understand evolution as a Christian. That's the book called Finding Darwin's God. You don't have time for it on the whole show, so I'll give you a quick synopsis. Basically, what, 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 the way in which a person of faith reconciles themselves with evolution is actually very simple, and that is to believe that the Creator fashioned a universe and the world in which the laws of physics and chemistry and the processes of nature would do the work that he intended, which is the evolution and uh, the origin and evolution of life as we know it. Um, I don't find any inconsistency in that. Does it contradict a literalism in the book of Genesis? Sure it does. But if you understand the book of Genesis the way traditionally Christian scholars have understood it, it's not a book of science and history. It's basically a book of revelation that talks about the relationship between the creator and his creation and the sinful nature of our species, sinful nature of mankind. That's how I understand it. I don't look to Genesis to teach me history or philosophy. The last point is... Should this be taught in, should creationism or intelligent design be taught in schools? Possibly as a cultural phenomenon in social studies class, as a historical process in a class on U.S. history, teach the Scopes trial, teach about the struggles. But to take an idea that frankly is not science, that has been roundly rejected by the scientific community and has no scientific credibility, and to present that idea to students saying pick one or the other is to profoundly mislead students. And I don't think we should ever do that in a science classroom. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And I agree with you. Uh, You know, look, you can call it singularity. You can call it the unmoved mover. You can call it God. Whatever you call it, we... We're looking at the same beginning, so we haven't solved any questions uh, with the names that we decided to use, the nouns. Now, we interviewed J. Scott Turner just a couple of weeks ago, Professor. Uh, you, I'm sure you know who he is. And he made yes, two points. He made two points that stand out in my mind. The first, uh, when you look at the modern interpretation of Darwin's work, 
In his view, you discover that Darwin did not argue for much of what is held in the modern tradition. The second, and perhaps the most outstanding claim in my view, is that evolution is a cognitively driven phenomenon. That is, birds fly because they wanted to fly. So before we go back to your book, let me ask you this. What are your what is your view on those two points? Is evolution as much philosophy as it is used today as as science and uh, what what's your perspective on a cognitively driven evolution? Um the, the well let, 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 let me make a point about the entire field of evolutionary biology Please. Wade, wade into a department of evolutionary biology we have one here at brown and lots of other schools do and you will see people doing every day what i would call hard science comparing dna sequences prospecting for fossils uh studying uh, basically rates of reproduction, population genetics, trying to understand how, where new genes come from and if they are favorable, how these new genes spread through populations by mathematical modeling and also by empirical studies in the field. This is, this is hard science. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, you know, it's not basically a philosophical way of thinking that it pre-imposes or pre-decides the conclusion. To me, that's what evolutionary science is like. Now, one of the reasons I wrote the book The Human Instinct is because I think that very often um, evolution, broadly construed, um, is interpreted um, in a way that actually becomes more philosophical, even more political, uh, than any scientific field should. Um, and, and one of the questions I tried to answer in this book is, why are there so many people who are suspicious or resentful of evolution? Um, the author Marilyn Robinson, Pulitzer Prize winner for the Gilead Trilogy and many others, a wonderful writer, um, has written essays against what she calls Darwinism. And she says Darwinism, she doesn't really use the word evolution much, she says Darwinism is a grim doctrine that basically seeks to portray the human being as inherently selfish and inherently greedy and inherently without virtue. And that Darwinism argues that morals, sense of right and wrong, are not real, but are simply evolutionary adaptations and having no value of their own. Um, I think, quite honestly, that she is correct in that criticism. So that one of the things that I tried to do in this book is basically to say, look, Evolution, properly understood, is not this grim doctrine that debases the human spirit. If you actually look at the authentic uh, evolutionary story, the evolution of our species, the adaptations that have actually produced the brains that we carry around and that we work with, it really is actually a grand and glorious story. And I think, for example, of the way in which someone like Carl Sagan um, approached the appearance of humans. And he basically said, we human beings, we are material. We are made out of stardust. But we are the part of the cosmos that has become alive, aware, and conscious. We are the, the locus, the nexus of the universe itself waking up and becoming aware of itself. And to me, that's the right way to think about evolution. Amen. Amen. You know, I, I, I want to ask you so many more questions. Maybe we're just going to have to bring you back to the show. I would, uh, you, I'm enjoying this discussion, Eldon, and I would love to come back. Well, that's wonderful. I appreciate and, it. And, Listen, and, and, if you, and if you do that, I'll make darn sure you get a copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we'll just plan on that. I'll see that it gets plugged in. We have about 30 seconds, Professor. Please share with our audience how they can learn more about you, where they can pre-order your book, and so forth. Um, the book is called The Human Instinct. You can find it on Amazon, of course. It is published by Simon & Schuster. It will be available on April 17th. And in terms of finding more out about me, if you simply Google, as you said, uh, my name and my school, which is Kenneth Miller at Brown University, uh, you will find a whole host of articles, uh, a, a lot of YouTube videos, uh, some information about the court cases I've testified in and my other books. Yeah, that's one of the questions we missed out on because you were a key uh, 
uh, what uh, witness in the Kitz Miller Dover trial. But that's right. All right, everybody yeah. out there, do check it out. I'm sorry, but we're out of time. Thank you, Professor, for sharing uh, for your willingness to share your work with us today. We've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll join us again next week. Until next time, remember, wherever you are, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.